Hey guys, in this episode, we're going to be looking at a popular unsupervised machine learning algorithm called hierarchical clustering. So as with all clustering algorithms, the job of hierarchical clustering is to take data like so and to identify clusters within the data. So in this episode, we're going to be focusing on something called agglomerative hierarchical clustering, where we start off with n clusters. And here we treat each data point as a cluster and we end up with one cluster. So the way this algorithm works is by firstly, as mentioned before, we treat each data point as a cluster. We then calculate the Euclidean distance each cluster is away from each other. So here, Euclidean distance is simply just the straight line distance between two points. So for this step, we're calculating the distances each point is away from each other. These distances are recorded in what's called a distance matrix. As I'm just trying to demonstrate how this algorithm works, these distances given are rough and not completely accurate. For step two, we use the distance matrix to identify the clusters closest to each other. So in this case, it's between the clusters A and B and the clusters D and E. We then link these clusters together to form a new cluster. So here, clusters A and B have been linked together to form a new cluster, and same for E and D. We then record this linkage in what's called a dendrogram. For step four, we calculate the distance each cluster's mean point is away from each other. So here, the means of C, G, and F are simply just the points themselves. And since D and E have linked together to form a new cluster, their mean point is given here. And for A and B, their mean point here. So calculating the distances and recording them in a distance matrix, we obtain this. And for step five, we repeat steps two to four until one cluster is formed. So for step two, we identified the clusters which were closest to each other, which in this case are between the cluster A and B and C, and D and E and F. And for step three, we link these clusters together. So here, the point C has been linked with the cluster containing A and B, and the point F has been linked with the cluster containing D and E. And for step four, we calculated the distance each cluster's mean are away from each other, and recorded them in a distance matrix as shown. And going back to step two, we identified the clusters closest to each other. And for step three, we link these clusters together. So here, the point G has been linked with a cluster containing F, D, and E. And again, for step four, we calculate the distance each cluster's mean point are away from each other. And since this is just one distance, it must be the smallest as identified in step two. And linking these final clusters together, we obtain a single cluster and move on to step six. And lastly, for step six, we cut our dendrogram to give the clusters identified by our algorithm at that point. So here we've cut our dendrogram where we had two clusters identified, one cluster containing the points A, B, and C, and one cluster containing the points G, F, D, and E, as shown here. Sometimes it can be difficult to determine where exactly we should cut our dendrogram, so you may have to do a bit of exploring looking at different cuts and the resulting clusters. One thing to note, however, is that as we go up our dendrogram, our distance between clusters increase. So for example, the cluster containing the points A, B, and C, and the cluster containing all points have quite a large distance here, showing that there is a large distance between these two clusters. So sometimes it could be a good idea to cut our dendrogram where we have these large lines like so but it may be difficult to determine these cuts, especially with large data sets. Note that in step four of our algorithm, we calculated the mean points of each of our clusters and then calculated the distances each cluster is away from each other based off of these mean points. For steps two and three, we then identified the shortest of such distance and linked these clusters together. So in this example here, we're linking cluster A with cluster C because the distance from the centroid of cluster A the centroid of cluster C is shorter than the distance from the centroid of cluster A to the centroid of cluster B. There are however many other linkage methods in which we could use. For example, average linkage, where we calculate the average distance each cluster is away from each other by calculating the distance each point is away from each other in each cluster and then averaging these distances. So here we're linking cluster A with cluster C because the mean distance from cluster A to cluster C is shorter than the mean distance from cluster A to cluster B. There is also complete linkage, where here we're linking cluster A with cluster C, because the maximum distance from cluster A 
to cluster C is shorter than the maximum distance from cluster A to cluster B. There is also single linkage where we link cluster A with cluster C because the minimum distance from cluster A to C is shorter than the minimum distance from cluster A to B. A slightly more complicated linkage method is called Ward's linkage method. And the idea here is we measure the within cluster variance of each of our clusters. And the variance here is measured as a sum of square distances. Each of our points are away from the centroid or mean point. So we'll denote the variance of cluster A as VA, the variance of cluster C as VC, and likewise the variance of cluster B as VB. We then look at what the variance will be if we link the clusters together. So the variance for the clusters A and C will denote as total variance AC, and for AB, total variance AB. So the increase in variance for AC we will denote as IVAC is equal to the total variance of AC minus the variance of A plus the variance of C, and the same applies for clusters A and B. So here we're linking cluster A with cluster C because the increase of within cluster variance of clusters A and C is lower than the increase of within cluster variance of clusters A and B, i.e. the increase in variance for AC is less than the increase of variance for AB. Some advantages of hierarchical clustering are we do not have to manually select the number of clusters beforehand as we did with k-means clustering. It's also fairly easy to implement. There are a lot of libraries out there, such as scikit-learn, where we can import a hierarchical clustering algorithm and implement it on a dataset. The dendrogram produced from hierarchical clustering can give us some useful information, such as the distance between clusters. There are also no need for many random centroid initializations as we did with k-means clustering. Some disadvantages are with large datasets, it is difficult to determine the number of suitable clusters from the dendrogram. Also, hierarchical clustering is quite computationally expensive and is slower than k-means clustering and is also sensitive to outliers. I hope you guys enjoyed watching this episode and learned something new. If you have any questions or comments, please leave them in the comment section below. For the next episode, I plan to show you guys how to implement hierarchical clustering in Python. Thank you guys for watching.